early in the summer. It was a fantastic three-day conference. And I was able to interview Michelle Alexander on Thursday. And then Saturday morning, Lynn spoke, and I was on a panel after. That was the first time I met him. I was very impressed with his presentation, his knowledge, and his experience. Because many of the things that he said mirrored my own experience in terms of being incarcerated, coming home, and having a vision, and then moving forward to create that vision. Subsequently, I began to be further associated with him and to um, look at his organization, which is Just Leadership USA. The model of this organization is that those that are closest to the problem are most likely to be able to have a solution. And that is the reality. When you look at mass incarceration, those of us who were intimately involved in mass incarceration have literally spent years thinking about alternatives to mass incarceration. Glenn spent six years in the cell, and he came home, and he formed a dynamic organization which is centered around training returning citizens, formerly incarcerated persons, to lead the struggle against mass incarceration. His first cohort of leaders graduated this past month, 20 persons who have gone through this leadership training and are moving out in terms of using the leadership skills that this organization imparted to them to lead returning citizens in the struggle against mass incarceration. It is imperative that as we think about how we are going to fight against mass incarceration, that we utilize the skills, the experiences, and the talents of those who were part of that. A little earlier this evening when I came to um, this hotel, Sandy had asked me to um, come early and to help put together this cell. And that was kind of different. You know, um, myself and Anthony and five and um, four or five other persons who were here literally took this off the truck and we constructed it, along with her husband who spearheaded it and he's a fantastic supervisor of operation. <laughs> <laughs> so we put together this cell and so many things went through my mind when we put this cell together. Because, one, everybody in this room, before you leave tonight, walk through this cell. Step inside the cell to get a feel of what an incarcerated person goes through when you live in this tiny space. I spent 25 years of my life in spaces like this. And it was almost a, a catharsis tonight to put together this cell and to present it to the outside world so that you can get a sense of what we went through. Those of us who have experienced mass incarceration on an intimate level are eminently qualified to lead the struggle because we have lived it. And more important, our families have lived it, and our communities have lived it. So what Glenn is doing is of immense importance. I've applied for the second cohort of the leadership training, and I'm looking forward to it. Because what this is going to be is a nationwide movement of formerly incarcerated leaders who are going to coordinate our efforts so that all across the country, we identify the best practices that are being used, and we unify that and move it forward so that we can motivate good-hearted people like yourselves to join us and to move with us so we can fight against mass incarceration. Mass incarceration is a $80 billion, 24-hour, seven-day-a-week operation. In order for us to effectively move against it, we need Glenn Martin, we need the 
Just Leadership USA. We need all the grassroots organizations that are fighting against it. And we need the, the Pennsylvania Council of Churches and organizations just like you across the country to realize that this is the new civil rights movement of our time. If Martin Luther King were alive, Malcolm X, Major Evers, Rosa Parks, they would be in the movement against mass incarceration. Because mass incarceration is insidious. It is enveloping our communities. It is a blight upon our society. It is imperative for us to do as much as possible to join this struggle and to ultimately win so that we can transform our society. It is my honor to introduce Glenn to you, so you can listen to him, learn from him, and above all, follow in the direction that he is leading. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for that great uh, introduction. So, I am, this is a big podium. <laughs> I'm like a really little guy back here. Um, I, I'm really honored to be here. Um, and I really appreciate the fact that I'm looking out onto an audience of uh, people I don't recognize. Uh, I often find myself in front of audiences uh, who I recognize. And although it is important to preach to the choir, um, we're not going to solve this issue until more and more Americans have a better grasp of how we got here, how far we've come, and how far we have to go. So thank you to the, uh, to the uh, Pennsylvania Council of Churches and for the formerly incarcerated leaders who actually helped to conceptualize uh, this event um, and for inviting me here. So faith-based communities have always played a significant role and have even driven a great deal of criminal legal system reform in America. Religious reformers, for example, were instrumental in the transition from the brutal form of corporal punishment to the modern penitentiary system, which now requires its own radical transformation. The United States has the highest rate of incarceration in the world. Our country has 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prison population. Has anyone ever heard that before? Yes. That's pretty common knowledge these days, right? That's a great thing, actually. Just a few years ago, that actually wasn't uh, common knowledge. But I like to start with the numbers, because uh, it's important for us to understand how far down this road we've gone. And then we'll talk about stuff that's actually even more important than just the numbers themselves. Um, but on any given day, we have 2.3 million people behind bars in the United States. Um, and then we can't forget another 5.6 million under criminal justice supervision. And we've been doing this for so long now that 65 million Americans have a criminal record on file in the United States. 65 million Americans. Uh, 100 million if you count people who have arrest records also, not just conviction records. Um, and arguably there are many places in life in the United States where an arrest record alone is enough to bar you from opportunity and serve as a scarlet letter for the rest of your life. And then also when we talk about the 2.3 million people in prison on any given day, we also lose, fact, we also lose sight of uh, what I see as the churn of the system, for instance. I mean, I live in New York where you have a jail, Rikers Island, uh, that has 7,600 people there on any given day. It used to be 24,000 at one point. Um, and, and those numbers are pretty significant, but at the same time, even this year alone, when there's 7,600 people, there was 72,000 admissions. So to give you a sense of, like, don't, you can't lose sight of the churn, even if you look at the large numbers uh, on any given day. So there are currently five times as many people incarcerated now as back in 1970. And incarceration has become the default remedy for a host of situations that we've labeled as criminal, whether it's homelessness, joblessness, lack of health care, mental health disorders, poor education, you name it. And of course, black skin. So I'm going to abandon my speech um, so I can move away from the podium. 
folks don't mind. Uh, so 20 years ago, 21 years ago, I went to prison. Um, and I was uh, facing 20 to 40 years in prison. That was my first offer. And I want to talk a bit about mandatory minimums and what it means to be facing 20 to 40 years in a second and how that got us here. But I just want to give you a little bit of my journey because I know when I'm listening to people speak, I'm often trying to figure out who this person is and what qualifies them to even be standing here speaking to us. And I'm going to help you understand that my experience is part of what qualifies me, um, but also the fact that I have done the work for an extremely long time. In fact, from the moment those handcuffs uh, were on my wrist and I was uh, pulled into the criminal justice system, I quickly, quickly realized how much hypocrisy was built into that system how that system tended to be way more wicked and insidious than anything or any person or any situation I had encountered in the uh, very tough community I grew up in back in the uh, 80s and 90s, Bedford, Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. And I said to myself, uh, you know, how is it that this entire country can be brought into a concept or an idea that impacts so many Americans uh, in such a destructive way and, uh, and continue to either support it or turn their backs on it or remain neutral about it. Um, what is it about this system that it has found a way to operate in a way that doesn't tap into the morals and the values and the conscience of Americans? Um, and so, you know, I went into the system fairly bright, arguably, um, and they, they say ignorance is bliss. You know, I sort of wished I was ignorant because I felt every minute of it. Um, and at the same time, it allowed me to be extremely an it allowed me to be extremely analytical while I was in the system and really take stock of what it was that was happening there. And forget about my own case for a minute and what got me locked up. Because the truth is that um, it, in that particular instance of getting locked up, I actually had the resources to hire a private attorney a pretty expensive private attorney, and quickly realized um, how when you have access to resources, your outcomes in the criminal justice system are much different. I told you my first offer was 20 to 40. I ultimately only served six years. Um, $108,000 later, I served six years instead of 20 to 40. And, um, and I had been locked up a number of times before that when I had no resources. Um, and I saw how the outcomes looked a whole lot different. Um, so that was my first experience with the, uh, the fact that the system operates differently for people who have means. Um, but then I got to, so then I went on Rikers Island, which is, you know, they call it gladiator school. And, you know, that's not made up. They call it gladiator school for a reason. When you get there, you either quickly learn to be uh, a predator or you learn to be prey. And does that mean that the people there are inherently bad? Like we have this conversation in America about how people go to prison and if you send the nonviolent people there, then they just learn how to be more hardened criminals. And that wasn't my experience. My experience is that in prison, what you learn is to live without hope. And you learn how to live without compassion. And you learn how to live without opportunity. And arguably, those dehumanizing things will create the type of people that will further engage in criminal activity. So it wasn't about me learning from other people how to be criminal. It was me doing what human beings do, which is learning how to survive in a situation that feels as though it's meant to steal your humanity and steal uh, everything that most human beings want in this world, their dignity. Um, and so, while Rikers was a really dangerous place, I have three stab wounds in my body, one in my neck and two in my back. Um, and I'm, you know, if you look at my entire life, you'd say, like, this guy is not a violent guy, but if you want to survive on Rikers, uh, you quickly become the guy who doesn't allow yourself to be taken advantage of, or you become the person who gets crushed. Um, and then I left Rikers, and I knew I had a few more years to do, and I was being transferred to state prison. And I got to state prison, and you know, once you're sentenced, and you sort of have a sense of what the rest of your life is going to look like, the next few years at least, um, it's a little, little, little easier to start sort of figuring out how you're going to take advantage of that time. And I, I got to state prison, and someone looked at my grades on the way through orientation and said, um, you should go to college. And it was the first time anyone had ever said that to me. You know, it could have been said to me 10 years earlier. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite was said to me. Um, and here was a person in a position of authority, someone I had respect for, 
someone who didn't have to take the time out of their lives to say you should go to college, someone who saw something in me that I truly didn't see in myself at the moment. And I ended up 10 hours away from New York uh, at a prison that had one of the last remaining college programs in this country. Um, and being sent 10 hours away, you know, people should know that that's pretty much the norm, right? Like you tend to do your time really far away because prisons um, are the most amazing stimulus package for rural communities in this country. Um, that's how prisons have been built over the last few decades in response to loss of industry around the country. And in fact, I had a correction officer who said to me on the way out of prison, he said, uh, you know, you being here helped me get my boat, and when your son gets here, he's going to help my son get his boat. Oh my God. That's when I learned that Black Lives Matter in this country, when that correction officer said that to me. And it was difficult to hear, but it was the truth. And it also reminded me that we can talk about crime and punishment all day. We can talk about redemption, we can talk about rehabilitation, we can talk about transformation, but if we're not talking about economics, then we're not getting to the heart of where we've ended up as a country in terms of our ability uh, and our desire and uh, the lobbying for us to uh, monetize misery in this country. That's what we've learned how to do. Um, so I get to state prison and the first thing I noticed is that I was surrounded by people who did not look like what I saw on television. And that might sound strange from someone who's also in the system, but I was immediately blown away by the capacity and the intelligence and the compassion of the people who I met in prison. And I often tell a story, and a couple of you might have already heard it, but uh, it's worth telling again. Um, in New York State, when you transfer from one prison to the next, you're on the road sometimes for two or three days, even for a trip that might take a few hours. And that's part of the machinations of the system, how it operates. You have a correction facility worth of correction officers on the road on any given day just moving people around. And it's hard to figure out what the underlying intention is. Sometimes they say it's security. But I end up in a cell with a guy in a really scary prison. Like, use your imagination. You know, close your eyes, think of the scariest prison you can imagine with the towers and the dark wall and the, the gray cloud hanging above with the lightning bolt. And it was this prison, it's called Auburn, upstate New York. And, uh, and I get put into this, you know, I, I walk into the prison, there's a row of cells, it felt like it was about 200 cells long, very dark. And back then they were double and triple bunking people in New York State. So as soon as you walk into a cell, you can pretty much be guaranteed you're walking in a cell with someone already there, sometimes two people. And I walk into the cell, and the cell slammed shut, and it was a Friday, so I knew I was going to be there for the weekend. And there was a guy there, his name was Arthur, and you can't be in a small space like this for long, although this is a pretty big cell, this must be the condo of cells. Um, I'm assuming the inside of the cell is a whole lot smaller. Um, and his name was Arthur, and you, you know, when you're in a space like that with someone, you you get to know them, or at least you want to know enough to make sure you're in a safe place. And so I learned his name quickly. Um, and the thing about uh, our prison system is that it's heavily based on punishment, right? So all the values you might hear about on television, proportionality and parsimony and redemption and transformation and, and, uh, and, and all the things you would hope that our criminal justice system contains, um, for me, just didn't exist. Punishment existed. And every move was about punishment. And I'll give you some examples of how people continue to get punished even after they're in prison, um, mostly as a way for uh, the staff of the correction department to control uh, behaviors. And I don't mean control them towards rehabilitative outcomes. I mean literally to try to keep everyone on a conveyor belt, sort of moving the way they want them to move. So we're in the cell, and the reason I talked about punishment is that the correction officers opened all the windows along the tier. And so this is over in New York, middle of the winter. Uh, it was only a matter of time before the cells were about 40 degrees, 45 degrees. And you have one thin blanket, if even. And, uh, and after about 24 hours, I mean, first I'm getting to know him. So he went in when he was 17. He did 17 years. He was 34. Um, he got locked up uh, under our Rockefeller drug laws in New York State. Anyone know Rockefeller drug laws? Yeah? So that's what, you know, for the people who don't know, uh, New York State led the way in this country around what we call mandatory minimums. Essentially about uh, 40 years ago, we decided that judges were way too soft and that we wanted to take the power away from judges. And so we decided that if you were convicted of a certain crime, 
that you would get a certain amount of time and the judge wouldn't be able to have any discretion about that. So if you got arrested for a key of coke in your car and you got arrested for the same and you've been selling drugs forever and making a ton of money and ruining lives and so on and you just got paid by her to carry the drugs, same amount of drugs, once you're both convicted, you both are probably facing 25 years to life. It doesn't matter that I'm the judge and I know that there's some nuance in the differences with your case. Um, and so that's how he ended up. So he was six, he was 17, and in New York State, uh, if you're 17, if you're 16, you're an adult. Period. Period. Like you're, a, you can't rent a car, you can't smoke, you can't drink, but you can go to prison and you can make poor decisions about whether to take a plea or go to trial. And he went to trial. Um, I guess the prosecutor was offering him 10, 15 years. Uh, he was facing 25, and he thought he could beat it in trial, and he did, and he blew, and he got 25 years. Um, so I learned about his story. I also learned about how addicted uh, he became to drugs in prison. And for people who've never been to prison, I would think you'd say, like, how do you become addicted to drugs in prison? Um, I gotta tell you, I didn't smoke weed until I went to prison. <laughs> I grew up in a really bad neighborhood with a lot of drugs, but the closest I've ever been to drugs was in prison. Um, and part of it was people who serve time bring it in, but also correction officers bring it in. Um, so I'm not surprised that a person becomes addicted to drugs in prison, and he was. And, um, and after about a day, I started becoming ill, and he knew it. You know, I was getting sick, I was coughing, I was sneezing all over the place. And so he says, Glenn, do you, do you want me to make you a cup of tea? Yeah, who said uh-oh, because that's what I said. I was like, where's the correction officer? Like, I'm and I said, Arthur, are you going to make me a cup of tea? He's like, you're getting sick. I want to make you a cup of tea. And I was like, okay, make me a cup of tea. And he takes a plastic bottle, plastic soda bottle, and he fills it with water in the sink that's in the cell with us. And he ties a string to it, and he fastens it to the light fixture in the cell. And anyone who's ever served time knows the end of the story before I even get halfway through. And he clears off the bunk of the mattress, and he asks me to look for the correction officer, and he rolls the toilet tissue really tight, and the bottle hovers over the fire, and the bottle begins to melt. The bottle, the plastic bottle, literally shrinks, um, but it doesn't burst. And the water in the bottle, after a few minutes, uh, begins to boil. And he rips open the lapel of his prison outfit, and he has two tea bags in it, and he pushed the tea bags in the bottle, and he handed me the bottle and said, uh, here's the cup of tea. And the reason I tell that story um, is we can talk about those statistics I named earlier, um, but human beings are not motivated by numbers for too long. When you first hear them, you sit back in your seat. If I asked you tomorrow, I bet you if I asked some of you right now, you wouldn't remember half the statistics I just talked about. But I tell that story because this, one, people in prison are human beings. We call them felons and offenders and convicts and prisoners and all the words that are given to us by the system to refer to them, which makes it really easy not to think of them as human beings, whether you do it deliberately or not. The fact is words have meaning. And the fact that this guy could have been, I mean, this is a system that's meant to put his lights out, right? Come in when you're 17, do 17, have another six or seven years, and the guy who comes in with a violent robbery is actually gonna be out way before you. The system is meant to crush this man and yet he found compassion for a person he had only known for less than 24 hours. Um, and, you know, if you're the type of person that is more motivated by, you know, who we are as a country and the need for us to be a really strong country, um, then I would argue that what he did in that cell for me showed a huge amount of human capital and human capacity going to waste. And the important part of that story also is, you know, people look at me and they say, Glenn, you're the exception. You're clearly the exception, right? You served six years in prison, like, look at all the things you're doing. Uh, but the truth is, I've been exposed to exceptional opportunities. I'm not the exception. In fact, if you look at my rap sheet, I'm the same kind of, I'm, if you look at my rap sheet, I'm the person that our president would throw under the bus right now. You been listening to our president? Yeah, he would throw me under the bus. I met him about two and a half weeks ago. I said that to him in his ear. Um, so let's remember that also, right? Especially people of faith, right? So who do we want to save from that system? At Just Leadership USA, we have a year-long leadership training, and then we have these emerging leaders training so we can tap into other leaders. And, um, and we don't screen people out for the type of convictions very deliberately. 
right? Hold on to your hats. We have sex offenders in the cohort. We have people who committed murder, people who committed manslaughter. And then we have people who did probation for nonviolent drug offenses, the type of people that most policymakers and most people who are talking about ending mass incarceration feel really comfortable saying they don't belong there. Come on, first time nonviolent. Hillary Clinton, she said, right, just last week. Nonviolent, first time drug offenders who went in for marijuana when they were 16 and now they're doing 30 years. I don't know those people. I didn't meet those people when I served time. And even if those people don't deserve to be there, and even if you convince Americans of that, all you've convinced them is that that person doesn't belong there, or people like that person doesn't belong there. And you know what ends up happening? You lose sight of the fact that the entire system doesn't work. And it works for no one. It works for no one. Unless the only thing you care about is punishment. Then you might argue that it works very well. Because it does a good job of not just punishing people on the way in, but continuing to punish them. So I served the rest of my time, and I earned a two-year college degree, a two-year liberal arts degree while I was in prison. And I'm happy to say that after 15 years of work, uh, alongside many other formerly incarcerated leaders, we were actually able to convince the Obama administration to return college eligibility to a, uh, a fair amount of people who were in prison. We didn't get Congress to do it yet. You know, that's the entire enchilada, but we did get the uh, administration to do what they could do within the ranks. So, so thanks to the leadership of formerly incarcerated people, more people in prison will have access to college over the next few years, and that was a win. Um, and the reason that's important to me is, yes, people need a college degree to come out and have the skills they need to go get a job, but that's not the only reason why, right? Right? I mean, we get a college education because we want to have a good job, but we get it for other reasons. And let me tell you my other reason. Let me tell you how it worked for me, right? I told you the conversation about the guy who said to me, you should go to college. Arguably, that was a two-minute conversation. If he was sitting in this room, actually, I wouldn't even recognize him. Because I'm not, I might even be romanticizing the moment, right? It's years later, seemed like a magical moment. But the truth is that it was transformative for me. Here's why. I get to college, and I'm sitting in these philosophy and psychology and all these different courses, and at one point in class, we were watching a film of the Holocaust. And you know, I grew up in a community where the only time you saw white folks is when they had on a police uniform. And we had a narrative about white people. About white people not caring, about slavery in this country, about Jim Crow, about being oppressed. And it was a multi-generational narrative. And it was a narrative that allowed me to easily engage in the sort of behavior that got me locked up. Because if you don't care about me, I don't care about you. And if you convince me enough that I don't matter, then every black person that looks like me don't, doesn't matter either. And so I get to prison, I'm sitting in class, I'm watching this film about the Holocaust. And at one point, it's not like I've never heard of the Holocaust, right? I'm not gonna tell you that. But, it went, but I've never seen like a documentary on the Holocaust, like live, real footage. And at one point, a, a bulldozer pulls up and shovels dead, naked human bodies into a hole in the ground. And it was just a, it was a moment for me to say, wait a minute, like, that narrative, something's not right about it. Like, could it be that human beings had much more in common? Could it be that these 20-something years of finding ways to other people um, was not the right thing to do, not the right way to learn? not true, not reality. And it might have been just a small chink in the story, but it's one that just continued to expand and continues to expand today. And even today, I still challenge myself. I have a lot of prejudices. Anyone in this room doesn't have any prejudices? Come on, put your hands up. Nobody in this room figured it all out? Okay, cool, because I haven't figured it all out. You know, I have a bunch of narratives about people that I still hold on to, unfortunately, and they still it still uh, hangs with me today. Um, but a two-year quality liberal arts degree that cost about $12,000, I would argue, is a better investment than $50,000 a year to lock me up. Actually, on Rikers Island, $167,000 per bed per year. A minute ago, we talked about the entire system, $80 billion. Actually, what you lose with that is the fact that uh, it also costs money to run our courts and our police departments and so on. The number is actually $260 billion a year. That's how much we're spending to lock people up. And two-thirds of people come back. Anyone ever work in corporate America? 
No one? A couple of people? Um, you ever heard of ROI, return on investment? <laughs> Imagine that. What other industry would operate with a failure rate of 65% and continue to operate? This one continues to operate. Um, but what that should also teach us is that uh, if you're going to use common sense to get us out of this mess, you're not going to get us out of this mess. We have all the common sense it takes. We have all the research it takes. What we don't have is hearts and minds. And so the question is, how do you get there? How do you get to the point where Americans finally say this is wrong? Because I can't think of any other movement that hit a tipping point based solely on the cost. Right? You think of other issues, you think of how we finally get to the point where we want to do things differently. It's usually because we get to the point where we say this is wrong. And I'm not suggesting there's not always moneyed interest in the way. There is. This is an issue that is steeped in lobbyists that have huge moneyed interests. And I think if you look forward to a goal like cutting the number of people in prison in half by 2030, that seems daunting. When I first wrote that and sent it on an email to my colleagues, I was like, they are going to kill me. They're trying to get a diversion program started, and I'm trying to cut the number of people in prison in half by 2030. Well, it's amazing how if you believe in something and you plant the seed of an idea, and you continue to bang away at it, and you help other people to have an imagination around it, how far you can get. When we first said that about a year and five or six months ago, um, people really did call me up and say, have you lost your mind? And I said, no, I have, I have a three-year-old, his name's Joshua, and he's gonna be 18 by 2030. And the statistics say that there's a huge chance he's gonna go to prison. And so, this is my effort to avoid that for this beautiful child of mine. Um, and yet at the same time, there's so many Joshua's in the world who are going to have their lives impacted by the system. If, we, if we're not bold and courageous, right? Like we're going to have a great conversation in this room tonight. Um, I can't wait until my colleagues get up here and respond to some of the things I have to say. Um, but if that doesn't translate into action when you walk out of this room, you may as well walk out of this room now. And I'm not saying you have to be on the steps of your legislature. Everyone can't do that. I'm not saying you even have to be the one calling the governor. Everyone can't do that. I wish you would. You don't have to be the one doing that. Sometimes all it takes is talking to a neighbor who never heard this stuff, doesn't care about this stuff. I was in California two days ago for an event. I was sitting next to a guy. I introduced myself. I started talking to him. I said, what brings you to this event? He said, um, oh, I was invited by one of my colleagues from Silicon Valley. And uh, I said, oh, so how are you connected to him? He said, oh, he works at Google, and I started a business five years ago, and I just sold it to Google for $140 million. I was like, oh, it's nice to meet you. <laughs> my business card. Um, but then I started digging deeper, and it was, it was fascinating how disconnected he was from this issue. And he's from a country, he's from India. I just got back from Mumbai myself. Like, significant amount of uh, poverty and a huge caste system, and, and yet, he just kept saying, like, well, why do you want to divert these young people from prison? Like, what if they kill somebody? I was like, wow, that's the narrative America has sold you, right? And that's part of it, right? So we need to tell the, the truth about who's in prison. And so how do you get there? So how do I go from leaving prison, and people might say, well, you left prison, so what happened? And I usually tell people, like, I ended up at a law firm, and they're like, I don't want to talk to this guy, he ended up at a law firm. And here's the nuance in the story. So I come home. I'm looking for a job just like anyone else. I have a college degree, right? I'm a fair-skinned black man with a straight nose. That puts me in the head of most other black folks. That's the truth, right? I like telling the truth, that's the truth. Um, and I visited about 50 employers, and they all turned me down, almost right away. And the couple that offered me the job, one or two, by the time I got home, and they sent it to the HR department, I got a call and say, sorry, you know, I wanted you, but the HR department said no. And that's in a state that has an anti-discrimination law for job seekers or criminal records. And it's been on the books for 40 years. New York. Enforceable law, everything. I just didn't know it existed. Anyway, it happened to me over and over and over again. And I just like, wow. I used to rob jewelry stores for a living. It seems like there was a lot more jewelry stores in the city than job opportunities. And we're talking about, um, we're talking about entry-level jobs. Entry-level, like stock person, bus person, in fact, the first job I got at the law firm that might sound so great was uh, answering the phones at the front desk for $16,000 a year. I owed $100,000 in fine fees, restitution, and child support.
but it was a foot through the door, so I took the job, and I quickly moved up in the law firm. And I had this job as a paralegal for two years, in between the six years I was at the law firm. And that was the most important job in my entire 15-year career so far. Why? Because I spent countless hours on the phone with other people who were exiting the prison system and listening to their stories and help them to navigate bureaucracy. And so what did that mean for me? It meant I quickly realized that no matter how much people was motiv were motivated to do the right thing, that the systemic barriers in the way meant that we should probably be studying the third of the people who make it to figure out how the heck they might have made it. Because the entire system is set up for people not to make it. We're doing a really good job of making sure people don't make it. Um, but I also realized that the people who were calling me clearly understood what was happening to them. They weren't naive about it. They understood the barriers that were in the way. And they understood how those same I mean, you think of the civil, like, our prison system didn't just, first of all, we haven't been locking people up at this rate forever. People realize that about 45 years of this madness. Um, and so you have to go back about 45 years and ask, like, what was going on in that moment? Like, our prison system was started at the intersection of civil rights gains and jobless ghettos. And if you look at the things we gained during the civil rights era, I call them the four E's, employment, equality, education, enfranchisement, enfranchisement, those things have been all but eviscerated by the criminal justice system for most Americans. And particularly people of color, surprise, surprise, particularly poor Americans, surprise, surprise, and white poor Americans too, by the way. Disproportionate impact on people of color, but more poor whites in prisons than anyone else, right? We often forget that. And if you think of movements in this country, and we're trying to go from moment to movement on this issue, we have to have a convergence of interests, right? Americans who don't look like me need to say, yeah, this impacts me too. This impacts my brother, my sister, my child, my uncle, me as an American. And I'm not sure we're there yet. I think we're developing an interesting popular movement on this issue. Orange is new black. Black became the new orange like 40 something years ago, folks. But orange is the new black, I get it. That's getting people to pay attention. But that's not a social justice movement. There's a huge difference. So I come out of prison, I get this job, I'm at the law firm, I'm a paralegal, then I move into policy work. I'm like, look, if I'm gonna if I'm hearing all these systemic problems, I don't wanna keep I don't wanna be at the at the bottom, at the foot of the river waiting for the bodies to show up. I wanna go upstream. I wanna figure out where the bodies are coming from. Six hundred and thirty thousand people exit our prison each year. That's a lot. You gotta ask yourself, when there's two point four million people in prison and six hundred and thirty are coming home each year, in three years we should be okay. Right? <laughs> Except if you go upstream, you realize that those bodies are being replenished at very high rates. And so, for me, policy work is about going further upstream and figuring out where the bodies are coming from and how we got here. And because it's 45 years, it's easy to put your finger on it. Mandatory minimums, truth in sentencing, three strikes laws, the privatization of prisons, all of the other lobbying interests that you know, deliver food to the prison, deliver laundry to the prison, you name it, everyone is gaining. Uh, the people who take advantage of the uh, low cost labor in prison, right? McDonald's, their uniforms. Mm -hmm. Eddie Bauer, his clothes. And I did that for about three years. And I did it mostly at the intersection of workforce development and criminal justice and traveled all over the country convincing people to remove barriers to employment. It was great. And then after six and a half years, I was like, wait a minute. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not gonna go to law school. And I find that, wait a minute, I'm not even talking anymore to people who are formerly incarcerated. I was talking to the United States Attorney General. I was talking to Sandra Day O'Connor. I was talking to Desmond Tutu. I was talking to governors all over the country, mayors, legislators. And sometimes I'd sit in a meeting and say something and say, oh, does that really reflect the reality that people who are coming home today face? Or is that me projecting what I went through six and a half years ago? And so I left, I quit, and I left. And I went to go work at a social service organization. Why? Because I wanted to continue to do advocacy work, but do it embedded inside of a social service organization. I see my staff member looking at me like, what happened to the speech? We worked on the speech all the way here. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, and 
And so I get to this place called the Fortune Society, and I build a, a, a policy unit embedded inside of a service organization that serves 4,000 people each year. And we didn't develop the agenda for the advocacy work until we talked to many, 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 many of our clients. And we didn't do the advocacy work until we empowered our clients to be a part of the solution to the problem. And we had huge success. I think the biggest one was getting rid of the Rockefeller drug laws in New York State. We got rid of about 95% of our mandatory minimums in New York State by mobilizing the very people who have been most impacted by that issue. Why? Because they have the most stake in the outcome. Surprise, surprise. They work harder, they work longer, they have more ideas, they've suffered from it long enough, they have ideas, they care about public safety. Imagine that. Right? Our country would have us believe that people in communities that are high crime don't care about public safety. That's not true. In New York, we were stopping 800,000 people per year stop and frisk. Now we're down to about 82,000, yet we're getting better outcomes. And when we were locking up 800, when we were stopping 800,000 people, 94% of them were people of color. And the rate of catching weapons was like a, a, a small percentage of 1%, like a tenth of 1%. Now we're stopping 82,000 people, and not only are we getting more weapons, but we're actually getting more weapons from the white people who are stopped than the people of color. So think about all that damage that was being done by taking stop and frisk, which is meant to be a strategy for police officers, and turning it into a policy for the entire department. And yet now we're doing so much less and getting better outcomes. But here's what bothered me, bothers me about the fact that we were able to end stop and frisk in New York. So I live in central Harlem, where I used to get off the train and walk three blocks. And by the time I walked three blocks to my house, you'd see about four or five people up against the wall with police officers. And now you don't see that. Great. But you know what else you don't see? Police officers. The police officers have decided that if you don't want us stopping and frisking you, if you don't want us violating your civil rights, maybe you just don't want us at all. And so remember that. Right? that that's part of the narrative. That's part of how we lie to ourselves. You know, so all, this, all the Black Lives Matter stuff, you know, law enforcement folks would have you believe that people hate cops and they don't want cops and they hate public safety and even though they're most impacted by these issues. And, you know, what, what do people say? Oh, I bet you want a cop when you need one. Yeah, everyone does. That's true. I just don't want them violating my civil rights. Mayor Bloomberg asked me that question at City Hall one year, just before he left. We were having a conversation with five of us and the mayor, and at one point he says, Glenn, I know how you feel about stopping frisk, but come on. It's all the blacks and Latinos committing all the crime, right? What do you want me to send my cops? And I looked over his shoulder at my boss, and she was turning red, and uh, I was like, I gotta say what I gotta say. I said, you know, with all due respect, Mr. Mayor, you can actually send your cops to high crime neighborhoods and have them not violate people's civil rights and still achieve public safety. Um, but even he had that narrative. Um, so the, why did I leave? So why did I leave such an amazing job? I was making $180,000 a year. 12 years later, I was making $180,000. All those employees that wouldn't hire me. I was actually running an agency with 212 people reporting to me. What I didn't say to you is that I also took over communications and I took over fundraising for the agency and I took it from 12 million to 24 million, the budget. And I rebranded it and I got them called to the White House over and over. And I got them from being just a local organization to an organization that's known nationally. But I couldn't stock shelves a few years earlier. So why did I leave? I took a week off at the 50th anniversary of King's I Have a Dream speech, September 2013. And I hired a friend of mine who's a lawyer to help me sort of flesh out where I think this country's going or not going on this issue, but what the opportunities really are and what's missing from the conversation. And I'm at home and I'm with Joshua. And if you don't, if you guys are on social media, how many people on social media? Yeah, if you get a chance, try, please follow me on social media. It's Glenn E. Martin, mostly because I like to show off Joshua and his afro. He's a cute kid. Um, and, uh, and I'm there, and Joshua's running all over the house while I'm trying to sort of think this stuff through. And King is playing in the background, and the speech is playing in the background. And so I said to myself, well, what would King say we should be doing right now as people who are people of faith and people who have morals and values that we care about? Um, I think he would say, well, wait a minute, 65 million people are impacted? That sounds like your base to me. That sounds like who you should be paying attention to. 
that sounds like the people who would be most motivated to be a part of the solution. And that just kept ringing for me. And then I said to myself, well, Glenn, how did you go from like exiting prison with you know a bus ticket, standing in Midtown, not knowing what's next, not even being able to find a job, to like meeting the president and being invited to the White House? Um, why? Because people made a pretty heavy investment in me. And I wanted to do that for other formerly incarcerated people. Because I said to myself, imagine if there's one of me doing this, maybe there's three or four of us around the country, imagine if there were hundreds. And they could easily be, right? When you have 65 million people, they won't all be leaders. But you could bet within that group, you could find some pretty powerful people. And I just left, I quit. I left. I said, I'm going to leap and I'm going to build the wings on my way down and we'll see what happens. And it's a membership organization, so we already have thousands of members around the country. If you're not a member, check your folder. You can be a member. It's a dollar a month. Why membership? Because if we don't build a community, if we don't build a movement, we're not going to tip this issue. Because what are we fighting against? Huge moneyed interests. How do you balance huge moneyed interests? Numbers. People. Numbers. A, think AARP. Anyone a member? Don't raise your hand. Tell me something. <laughs> but that's where it came to me. I was like, wow, AARP is so powerful. And the truth is, the majority of their they're, they're the largest membership organization in the world, 35 million members. But most of their members have no clue what the real advocacy work looks like. But they buy into this concept that this organization is representing something they really care about. And I hope that you'll understand that just leadership is representing something that hopefully you really care about. And people in prison are members, by the way. It's going to take us all to get us out of this mess. So we're a membership organization, but most importantly, we're a leadership organization. So what do we believe? We believe that people who are closest to the problem are closest to the solution, but furthest from power and resources. And that's what we think about all the time. How to invest in the leadership of people who are already leaders. I'm not building leaders. These people are already leaders. They're leaders. And we're hoping they gravitate towards us. Why? Because I want to take what took me 13 years to figure out, all the demystification that I've learned during the years, and, 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 and share that with other people. And then I also want to recognize that it's not just enough to say, okay, you're a leader now, come to the table. Because resources are equally important. The reason I can do what I do is because now we're a million dollar organization. We have a million dollar budget. Where'd that come from? My access to power and privilege. It took me 13 years. I don't want it to take 13 years for these other people to get there. I want to figure out ways to connect them to resources more quickly. So who'd we bring in to talk to them? The head of the Ford Foundation, the second largest foundation in the world. Darren Walker came in talked to them for a couple of hours. The heads of five other foundations. People, people who are running large movements around this country. People who are running organizations with 600 people on staff. All the stuff that I was blessed to come into contact with in my 13 years. I want to condense that and give it to people in a year. Because imagine if we could just keep pumping out these leaders. And that's what we're doing. So we talked about training 20 people. We actually ultimately trained, by the end of this year, about 153 people because of our emerging leaders training. And so what are we doing? We're building community, but we're building community with a shared vision and a shared experience. And so we already have a footprint in 18 states around the country as a result. That's an immediate footprint. When you think about building a movement, imagine that. We immediately have a footprint in 18 states. So we have a huge goal, cutting the number of people in prison in half by 2030. Do I believe that's the solution to the problem? No. No, that's not going to solve the problem. That's about shaking the field out of incrementalism. That's about getting people to believe in something big and something bold and something audacious. But the question is, how do we really get there? So the other thing that makes me hopeful in looking out in this audience is how many people I see in this audience who have privilege. Anyone take umbrage to that? The fact that you have privilege? You don't think you have privilege? Oh, no, I was thinking. Oh, OK, cool. <laughs> I thought you were going to take off the mask. And oh. like, Look, I'm black and poor. Um, <laughs> No, people in this room have privilege, but everyone in this room has privilege, actually. I have privilege, folks here have privilege, uh, but there's people in this room that have a different level of privilege, right? White skin is a huge privilege in this country. And so people often say, well, what does that mean? What do I do with my privilege? And I'm always saying this out loud, I've been saying it for the last seven or eight years. 
Um, a couple of things I'll say. One, when I recognized that I was in a position of privilege, I said to myself, oh wow, you're telling everyone else around the country that they should leverage their privilege. I often say like, recognize that you have privilege and then don't like recognize it and walk away from it. You're like, I don't wanna have my privilege. I don't, want, I don't have privilege, see, I'm just like you. That's not how movements hit tipping points. Movements hit tipping points when you say, yeah, I recognize I have more privilege than you and I'm gonna leverage that privilege for a shared vision that we have to help get to a tipping point. Look historically, that's how it's always happened. People who are closer to power and privilege need to be a part of this movement. That's just the fact, don't walk away from it, leverage it. And so when I found myself in a position of privilege at the Fortune Society, I could have just sat there. I could have chilled out, I'd have been making 300 grand a year, I'd have been chilling. I was like, no, that doesn't fit the vision. But you know what else doesn't fit? The saddest day I had in prison. The last day. I remember walking down a walkway, the front gate of the prison that I was in, because it had been doubled in size during the 80s. It was about a mile away. And in prison, you sort of, all the behaviors that you learn to survive are all the behaviors that will allow you to fail in society. Um, but it was amazing to me how the last day I was able to break through and, and cry. And I wasn't crying because I was so happy about going home, because the truth is I was scared to death of what was waiting. I was crying because I was leaving behind some of America's best and brightest. That's why. I was crying because I was leaving behind friends that I had made, people who supported me, people who made me tea when I was sick. And so when I was sitting in that position of power and privilege, I said to myself, does this feel like what you promised yourself you'd be doing when you walked down that long walkway and left those men behind? And the answer was easy, the answer was no. But I also recognized that it meant taking a risk. It meant giving away some of my own power. It meant recognizing that everyone is not on the same level, particularly in this country where it's rigged to be that way. But it also allowed me to recognize that I could use my privilege to invest in other people towards something that feels much larger than my own gain, my own vision for having a successful career. And so when I look out into, onto this audience, what I'm hopeful about is that if each of you walk out of this room and say, I learned something tonight, I'm even more motivated than I was before I walked in this room, but I am gonna go out and do something that feels as though I am spending my privilege, I am taking a risk, that it gets us that much closer to half by 2030. How do I know that? And will you know that when you do it? You may not. The person who said to me, Glenn, you should go to college, probably didn't even understand the seed that he was planting. And so you may not see what is reaped from the seed you plant when you go out there and spend your privilege to get someone else interested, some organization interested, some institution interested, your mom, your dad, someone to think differently. But you have to trust and you have to have faith that your investment is gonna help lead to this vision that is created by the very people that are most impacted by this system. Because it's not until people who are oppressed by a system are able to rise up and define that oppression and help define the solution and step into leadership roles that these sort of issues move forward. If you don't believe me, read your history books. You don't have to believe me, read your history books. There's never been any other model that's successful. I appreciate the opportunity to come here this evening and have this conversation. I actually think that what I bring to the table is no more powerful or valuable than any of the other formerly incarcerated people in this room. So I want to create the space now to hopefully be joined up here by my colleagues and hear, allow you to hear more from them, but more importantly, allow you to realize that I'm not the exception, that I was just exposed to exceptional opportunities. Thank you.
going to talk to you. Oh, okay. great. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, you need a chance. So maybe I'll, I'll hang out of here, actually. Okay. I have a lot of energy. I like to stand up. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I'll stand up, actually. Yeah. And I'll just stand up here. Ask me to speak from the yeah. um, I'm Silla Wahafti. Uh, I'm the um, Pennsylvania coordinator for the National Religious Campaign Against Torture, and I'm also organizing um, issues in solitary confinement around the state. We don't have as much time as I had hoped. You all have introductions to these three gentlemen, um, the ex and, and they will be speaking to, um, to a lot of what um, Dean's been talking about which we're very, very grateful for, is that it, it not only was um, a lot of information, but also I felt, you know, sometimes we get overwhelmed by this issue, and so this gave me at least a lot of hope. So I'm going to turn it over to John Dye. Um, we're fortunate that both John Dye and Bill DeWeese are both returning citizens, so they can speak to this, and certainly the Free. All right, we've got free returning citizens, so um, as well as their expertise with the work that they're doing, they also have experienced this. So if we'll just, if you can give five minutes, because we're actually not as fairly um, low on time, so. Thank you. I think one of the things that we really want to consider is what mass incarceration is and the effect it has on our communities and what we can do, as Glenn said, um, those of us who have privilege to impact mass incarceration. In our work at the Center for Returning Citizens, we deal with mass incarceration on many different levels. First of all, we deal with those who are just coming home from prison and they're trying to transition. They're trying to find employment at a living wage. We connect with their families. We integrate with their communities and move themselves forward and establish a life so that they will not reoffend and they'll not be reincarcerated. That's one aspect. We also deal with those who have been home for many, many years and are still suffering. Just this past week, we have a client who's been home over 20 years, and he's a chef, and he's a very good chef. And he works in nursing homes, and he has an exemplary record. Yet he's been fired continually, because in Pennsylvania, they're moving to a situation that all nursing homes have to certify their employers, and if you have extensive criminal backgrounds, they have to let you go. So even though he has been home, over 20 years, has never reoffended, has built a life for himself, he's still having employment problems. And that's a byproduct of mass incarceration. I had a female officer this past week, a wonderful person who's just been home maybe about a month. She's in a halfway house, she's found a job, looking for employment. Her situation is she's trying to retrieve her child, her daughter, who's three years old, from DHS. Females in the system have a unique set of circumstances than males. Over 70% of the females who are coming home have children. They're trying to retrieve their children from either kinship care, families, or DHS. That is an immense proposition. To establish housing, to establish a job, to show yourself responsible so that your children can be restored to you. That is a tremendous challenge. We have many children in our community whose parents are incarcerated. In an after school program, we have kids whose Father's doing life in, life in prison. These young people will never have their father in their life in a situation of freedom for their entire life. That's an awesome proposition. So we're looking at mass incarceration at many different levels. 
how to impact our communities, how to fight crime in our communities, how to combat social injustice, how to keep people who are returning citizens from reoffending and moving forward, and also dealing with at-risk youth so that they don't go into school to prison pipeline and become offenders. So all of these things we are dealing with in our struggle against mass incarceration. So what we ask is those who have privilege to support the organizations that are doing the real work in the community. TCRC is not funded by the state. We're not one of those bureaucratic organizations that receive state contracts. We're a grassroots organization that every day work in our community to battle mass incarceration. And we aren't funded on a high level. Organizations like ours exist in cities all across Pennsylvania. We need to link with these organizations and help bring resources because we're doing the real work that is the foundation of the struggle against mass incarceration. Uh, thank you very much. I'll use my five minutes and give you two and a half on my situation and two and a half on what I'd like to do relative to what Glenn talked about tonight. I was born in 1950, went to school, uh, Wake Forest, joined the Marines on graduation day. Uh, when I came back from overseas, peacetime deployment, the state legislator was deathly ill. I ran at 25, was sworn in at 26, became Speaker of the House, I had a strong career. I was one of the few people that looked like me that voted against mandatory sentencing in the 1980s. Very, very liberal voting record. And I was and am a person of privilege. And I had money for a good lawyer. And words that he shared initially, wicked, insidious, hypocrisy. I just got out 19 months ago. And I spent 23 months upstate. And the most resonating declaration that he made in his introductory comments and in his very strong and motivating speech tonight was about what special men, the best and the brightest among them, that he served with. Well, I was enveloped in a political corruption investigation where the Attorney General, who was running for governor, ensnared 26 of us. Many of them fled, some of us fought. If they want you, they got a good shot at getting you. And when I walked that yard, and when I got to the big house, and I'm talking about the home jail, what an unusual juxtaposition of terms, home jail, I looked out over the yard as the stream of humanity, about two battalions of Marines worth of humanity was making its way from afternoon yard day one, I could not fathom that 800 approximately were African-American men, 100 were Hispanic men, 300 were white men, and most half of the white men were child molesters who didn't leave the cell block. So we had 150 white guys in the yard. It was an incredible 23 months. But those youngsters took care of the old Marine, and they used to say, uh, they called me Mr. Bill, they called me the crooked congressman, they called me a lot of... <laughs> A lot of crazy things. They say, Mr. Bill, what are you, what are you doing here? I, and it's hard to, hard to explain theft of services. It's hard to explain it to myself, let alone to the people that I was involved with upstate. And they, one kid said, Mr. Bill, I know why you're, why you're up here. You stole all the money from the Capitol building. That's why you're up here. But fundamentally, fundamentally, and especially the 10% that were doing life, with me for 23 months. Exceptional men in some capacities, and in many capacities. And in that visiting room, I saw their families, and I'm keeping in touch with their families. I'm not allowed, I'm still on parole, I'm not allowed to keep in touch with them, but I have lady friends and other friends who are, in many cases, of the religious community who are trying to touch base with at least five of my former colleagues, all of them, all of them, doing life. So, I am fired up, I'm motivated. I've just gotten a little bit of traction where I'm doing some lobbying and some consulting for some of the labor unions. 
I am doing nothing except labor union work at this juncture. And avocationally, I want to spend the rest of my life involved in this. We all were exposed to Michelle Alexander's masterful tome, and it's frequently habituated on almost every cell block in America. It certainly was on B Block, at SCI retreat near Wilkes-Barre, where I was housed. And I saw her on C-SPAN on two different occasions, and I would rattle the door of the cell and make sure all the guys on B Block were watching. And I wanted to get involved, and thanks to Sandy, and uh, thanks to Jane Leader Janizek and others, I have at least uh, been able to rub elbows here uh, tonight, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to get involved in a, a more aggressive capacity, because this is a, this is a mission that needs to be uh, attacked, and I, I just want to join the battalion. So thank you very much for having me. Since I get to speak in about 20 minutes, I can keep mine short. Um, I get to speak in tomorrow morning. So I'm going to confine my uh, remarks to direct response to Glenn. I, Glenn made a point that I hope you didn't miss, that advocacy is preceded by embracing the, of those who are most impacted. And, 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 and my experience in working with groups like this is that you want to make it an issue. And it's not an issue. It's, 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 it's a, 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 every issue. This is the C. Wright Mill, my doctorate in sociology. Every issue, public issue, is the amalgam of personal trials. And so you've got, you've got his trial. You've got my trial. I thought it was interesting that, you know, no one thought I was a returning citizen. Some of you know, but, you know, uh, it doesn't matter. Because, see, what, one of the things that happens out here in this, I mean, central Pennsylvania, is... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> is that the narrative is that everybody's story who's a returning citizen sounds like Glenn's or sounds like the folks that Brother Harrell were talking about, but we're part of this, we're part of this. And that means that there are people you know who are part of this. And because we may work in other venues where we have to hide it, we can't turn it into part of the narrative that you want to invest in. We have to deal with the shame and the stigma surrounding incarceration. So that's number one, embracing the impacted. That doesn't just mean running down to Philadelphia. Glenn, I was passionate. You're down to 700, 700, 7,600 Rikers? Yeah, from 24,000, can you believe? That means that Philadelphia now has the largest jail population in America. Because we're only down there at eight, nine, eight thousand. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, Philly, Philly. In fact, the other thing about Philadelphia is that New York City is four times as large as Philly. So even when we were at ten thousand and they were at twenty, we were incarcerating at twice the rate right. in our jail system. So now we actually have more than you. You win. <laughs> that's that's our home state. So um, I have other things that I want to say, but I, I want to—I want to—I really want to thank Glenn because I think that the narrative—I think he made a wise decision. I want to point this out also in terms of his presentation. I know your staff may not have liked it, but <laughs> church folk aren't motivated by numbers; they're motivated by narratives. Sure. We're not motivated by statistics; we're motivated by stories. We're not motivated by facts. We're motivated by faces. And Glenn gave us a face tonight, and for that we should be grateful. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you. And I absolutely agree that um, stories, and that's why, as much as possible, bringing people into our communities that have experienced this, families or former incarcerated, um, is very, very important. Sandy, can we go over maybe two or three questions? Sure. 
And sure. Glenn, did you want to respond to any of them? No, let's take the okay. questions. Let's take, we'll, we'll take three questions. I know that we're running late. Tom. Rebuilding the inner city. Um, I, I can't help but think about the Marshall Plan. And, and I really, you talk about narrative. That's okay. You talk about narrative. That's the narrative that we should have. And opening the doors of capital so that guys like Jay and, and his associates can begin on a large scale. He wants to do a supermarket. I don't agree with him. But can do it on a large scale or a small scale, but open up the doors of capital. And, and the fellows, the people of talent that are in there can blossom and have money Friday night and food on the table. interesting comment about numbers. 260 billion yes. is one of the numbers that I heard. I need for you to clarify for me how that isn't profit some sort of way. And the reason I'm asking that question is this. Um, every time I hear about one drug addict, another person going to prison, this, that, and the other, the secondary question that follows is, how do these drugs get into our communities, our cities, our farms, wherever they're getting, how are they coming in? And the most popular answer is, the addicts are doing it. They're bringing it in, they're buying it, they're selling it. Someone has to traffic. And many of the addicts that I know, and many of the people that are part of your 60 billion are at the, the lowest end. So trafficking and moving anything other than towards the next hit, the next deal, the next whatever, the next high is all they can do. Who isn't profiting? Somebody has to be profiting from the huge incarceration of people in this nation all over the world, as it would be. Somebody has to be making, I don't know things that happen in this country that just happen because we're all just good people and it's the right thing to do. I do know that things happen because a lot of this gets spread a lot of places, thus creating lots of opportunity. So could you clarify for me your 60, 260 billion? billion dollars? Yeah. Thank you, and thanks for the question. Um, so what I didn't get a chance to tell you is I have two brothers, uh, one younger, one older, and one out of three black men uh, go to prison like in their lifetime according to today's statistics. In my family, it was two out of three. Um, but my older brother uh, became a federal correction officer uh, for 10 years. Uh, he fought in four wars, uh, became a federal correction officer, and now he's a U.S. Marshal. And it's interesting to watch how institutions change people long before people change institutions. Um, and how he has adopted a narrative of his own that allows him to do the kind of work that he does and be a part of that $260 billion uh, human killing machine that we have in place. Um, but I say that to say he was propelled from poverty, like we grew up extremely poor, um, first generation here from the Caribbean, um, to now being an upper middle class as a result of his involvement in the criminal justice system. So, so it's easy to have a conversation. The one we normally have is about private prisons and how insidious that is, and, and it is, except it's only 8% of the people in prison who are actually churning through private prisons. I think you have to dig deeper and realize that the same uh, insidious uh, incentives that drive the privatization of prisons also underlie our entire criminal justice system, right? Do people get that? Like it's almost, strangely, probably for a person like me to say, it's almost a bit of a distraction only to focus on private prisons, because like that correction officer said to me, you being here helped me get my vote, your son gets here, he's gonna help my son get his vote. And what he did in that one statement was to really crystallize um, those drivers 
underlying our criminal justice system. And the fact that so many people uh, uh, benefit from that system. So, so I think we're at the point now where the system has taken on a life of its own because a million Americans work within the system. Um, and so the question, and so that's why as we think about how to have a discussion about undoing mass incarceration, um, we need to tell the truth. And even our president, I love him, I don't think he's telling the truth. He's not telling the truth. Like, you know, this is a financial issue and it's not an issue about, you know, who, who did this crime, who did that crime, who deserves how much. You know, I, it's, you might hear me say this and say, oh, it sounds like Glenn doesn't believe in punishment. That's not true. If you notice, I've never said I felt like it was, you know, such an abomination for me to serve my six years. In fact, I started out telling you I kind of ripped the system off, right? So I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not a prison abolitionist. I'll be the first to say that. I think some people need to be incapacitated. Not for so long, but incapacitated. Um, but having said that, there is a system now that benefits so many Americans that that is a part of the driver. It has its own life. And so you talk about bringing drugs into communities. Let me just, I'll say this and I'll, I'll stop. I think you have to go deeper. Right? So there is a demand there for the drugs. Oh, I didn't hear yeah, no, and you have to ask yourself, why is there a demand there, right? Like, why, and, and, and why is it that people are being criminalized for the same drugs that are being used in other communities, except it's being used out of the medicine cabinet? Because that's what people are doing. They're, they're looking at poverty and hopelessness and despair, and they're self-medicating. And we could wake up tomorrow as a country and say, that's what's happening, and it's a public health issue, and it's not an issue of criminalization. I mean, we're 40 years into a war on drugs. We've locked up 45 million people. We spent a trillion dollars. And drugs are as inexpensive and available as, as when we started. So, so you're asking the right questions, but I, was at, I would ask you to do exactly what you said out loud, which is, if you want to know the answer to these problems, follow the money. It'll lead you to the solution. Follow the money. It'll help you understand how we got here and how it's so sustainable, even in a country where half the country now, including our president, saying this is wrong and we need to do something different. But don't, don't believe that activity is the same as, as reform, as change. You know, I often tell people, I say, what, what are people like us looking for when we think about prisons? I often show people the cell phone because I say this is, this is not pay phone reform. Right? This is not looking at a payphone and thinking, how do we tweak payphones? This is a totally new way of envisioning the way we communicate with each other. And that's what I believe we're hoping to come out of this with. A totally different way to think about how you achieve justice in this country. Thanks for the question. One more. Yes, go ahead. You mentioned the Rockefeller laws and the mandatory sentences that came out of that. And based on what I've read in the past, uh, a narrative was sold uh, to the NACP at that time, and they bought it uh, hook and sinker. And my concern was that perhaps law enforcement, with this whole war on drugs, exploited the pain in the community, the pain of mothers seeing their children die. What concerns me is that might be relived today because there's a new law enforcement policy now that's at work in some parts of Philly, some parts of Chicago, Kansas City, where they are saying that they want to reduce all these deaths in the black community by bringing in gangs wholesale and telling the gang leaders, the ones who are loosely connected, that if the top leader gets pulled down, we're going to pull you in with them. And I don't know if you've heard that, but that's a new strategy that is being used to try to, to try to stem the flood of violence. And I'm wondering if you've heard of that and what impact you think that would have on a new generation of young people yeah. as far as mass incarceration. So I'm familiar with the model. Um, there's more than one version of it. I think David Kennedy at John Jay, uh, Professor David Kennedy has this model. Um, and as a country, I think we've come to believe that uh, the only way to get black kids to behave is to threaten them. And that's what the model is all about, right? They bring people in, they tell you, we already got you, we got you on tape, we got you on camera, and if you don't behave properly. So, so when I think about that, I think about safety, and then I want, I want to hear from my colleagues on this one too. So safety, right? If, 
Let's just do an exercise real quick. I promise it won't take long. Just close your eyes for a second. Think about the safest day you've ever had in your life. Think about where you were. Think about what you were doing. Think about who was around. Think about how it smelled, how it felt. Think about what that safety felt like. Now open your eyes. How many people saw a police officer? <laughs> how many people saw a shotgun? How many people saw a, a, a tower, a police tower? No, none of that, no. That's because safety is not about law enforcement. <coughs> safety is about family and community and jobs and healthcare and education. But we lie in communities that are high crime. We say, oh, to get them safety, we gotta put more cops in that community. Cops clean up the mess. They're all the way at the back end. And so all these models that are springing up about how to achieve safety in poor communities of color, they're all alive. They're all alive. We've got to say that out loud. You know, we do it because we're scared, right? And we want like, these immediate results. And so if you just incapacitate everything that moves, you get there eventually, although you destroy communities in the long run. So yeah, I have, so, that's, so that's what's interesting about this moment that we're in and whether it's going to turn into a movement. And if it does, what's it going to yield? Because if it's all based on the existing context, this is what we get out of it. These kids are just inherently bad, and we're going to grab them, and we're going to threaten them. And when we threaten them, they're going to do the right thing. And if they don't, and we give them an opportunity, we're going to punish them even harsher, because we gave them a chance. As opposed to the kind of safety that exists in other communities, which has nothing to do with the hammer over a person's head. It has to do with hope, and opportunity, and compassion. I think we have to change the narrative and look at what is really going on in our community. Um, I didn't really get a chance to respond to what Tom said earlier about um, the hopes of returning citizens when they come home and what can be done. What we're trying to do is change the narrative. We really push the phrase returning citizens for many reasons. You know, formerly incarcerated, ex-cons, many of the things that we were called previously didn't fit who we were. We are citizens who are returning to our society with our skills, our dreams, our hopes, to reintegrate with our families, but also to use the skills that we possess to lift up our communities. Many of us have gone through a, a process of transformation while we're incarcerated. Because one of the side effects of living in a cell like this is intense introspection. When you're in a cell like this, you get a chance to look over your entire life and see what didn't work, and also see what kind of person am I that society has said that I've got to live here as opposed to living with my family and living with the community. So once you go through that process, and you come home. As Michelle Alexander has so wonderfully put it, we're assigned to second class citizenship. And we faced so many barriers that inhibited us from moving forward. But it shouldn't be like that. Because so many of the folks who lived in these cells have skills that they can bring back to the community and help to rebuild their communities. Mm -hmm. We're the foundation of our community. We take guys who have run major drug operations. And they dealt with supply, distribution, marketing, all the things that are the hallmarks of any corporation. They can take those skills and change the hustle and move forward in the communities and look at entrepreneurship. Why should a guy with those kind of skills be stuck into a $10 an hour job? That's not what he does. He's a leader. So we encourage that leadership by bringing the resources to organizations that are saying, take your skills and become entrepreneurs, be role models in your communities, be examples in your communities, and rebuild your communities. That's what is so essential. That's what the TCRC is about, incarcerated nation, just leadership, taking the skills and the innate qualities that we possess and promoting it on a level so that we can transform our communities and move our communities forward.
Just, I'm a politician. I know what it's like when nobody claps. So I want to clap. <laughs> Just uh, to close out, uh, my own perspective, uh, four quick points, one minute each. Uh, programs, college. When I got upstate, I talked to some of the older guys doing life, and they remembered college programs. And they'd been completely <coughs> obliterated. And speaking of programs, I didn't meet one person in 23 months at SCI retreat that thought that any of the programs were effective, whether it was drugs or alcohol or domestic violence, whatever. I'm just sharing that as an observation. Number two, second point, plea bargain. You walk the yard with 100 fellas, only six went to trial. 94 had to go plea bargain. They threw six counts at me. They said my people were campaigning in the Capitol building, and that was theft of services. But they also said they took a check. So that was theft by unlawful taking. And since they didn't tell the chief clerk that they were a crook, they called it theft by deception. And they said that I talked to them so that I was conspiring with them. And they said it was a violation of the State Ethics Act. And then they went to see my attorney, and they said, you tell that crazy politician to plead down to one, we won't send him to jail, we'll just giving probation. Well, I told them to fly a kite and that you can tell what they told me. But I really think that the whole concept of plea bargaining has to be looked at again. Third quick point. John Hager, who launched out this program tonight from Duke University. I went to Wake Forest and they kicked our butts a lot. But he's a good guy and he works for a superb gentleman. And I think that Tom Wolf might be the most elimocenary and liberal human being to be governor of this state in my 65 years on the planet. So I think we might have an avenue going forward, at least for the next three and a half years, vis-a-vis -vis the Capitol building, relative to some reform. Fourth and final point, because I'm going to keep my word, one, two, three, four. There's a guy named Todd Stevens from Montgomery County who just announced for attorney general. Big, tall, handsome guy, looks like a marquee fella down at the movies. Well, he's a prosecutor in Montgomery County, became a state legislator. To abbreviate my comments, I wrote him a couple letters from the penitentiary. He's on the Judiciary Committee. I told him all kinds of things that, I said, you don't have to come see me. They locked up a bunch of politicians. Go see Purcell, go see Dion, go see Manzo, go see Presky. Well, they locked up a lot of politicians. But anyway, there's so many things we can do to change this, to change this, this mass incarceration. Never wrote back, never wrote back, never wrote back. I ran into him the other night in, a, in an eatery down in Harrisburg. I said, why didn't you write back? Why didn't you write back? I looked up at the big, tall, handsome man. I said, why didn't you write back? <laughs> oh, I thought, you were, I thought you were joking. Joking? I'm in a state penitentiary. I said, I said, you didn't write back because you were running for attorney general, and you didn't want any correspondence going into a, into the big house to, 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 a, to a criminal. He started to stutter. What I'm saying is we got we got to go on the attack. We cannot let people that pretend like they are, you know, he's probably going to run on the war on drugs again. So, you know, lock him up and throw away the key. I can see that. Anyway. Thanks for uh, listening to that uh, declamation. <laughs> I believe that, and, um, Glenn, are you staying over too tomorrow? No. Now, unfortunately, yeah, Glenn will be have. leaving. But the other three will be, with, are you going to be, uh, Bill? I'm going to be here uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, late morning, through, Great. The, through the rest okay. of Okay. So we will have a chance to speak with all three of them. I know that we had to cut the questions short and the time short. But um, this was really, really helpful, I think, in beginning our path forward. And uh, I, it gives us a great uh, beginning. So another hand for everybody. Thank you.